All right, howdy y'all. Thanks for those that are hopping in a few minutes early. Um, just like we've done the past few days, um, there's a few, uh, I'm just gonna reshare out there. There's, there's not new things to do, but there's just some reminders about things to set up for the activities. Um, the new thing today um, is that we will be using OpenAI um, and specifically an API key for them to call some of their models. So this is the company that um, runs and powers ChatGPT, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so if you wanna follow along fully with the activity today, you will need an API key. Um, and they do give you a little bit of free um, computing uh, uh, power right, when you create an account there. So if you created that for this uh, bootcamp, you should have uh, that on hand. And I'll show how to use that once we get going. Um, but I'll drop as a reminder, some of the key links. Um, let me just go grab those really quick. I forgot to copy them off of the slides. Give uh, probably another five minutes or so um, as people are hopping in, and then we'll get going. Oh. And again, as people are, are filtering in, here's just a reminder of the, the key links for um, all the materials for the bootcamp. Um, and the notebook today is under the, the day three folder. And again, the only new thing that we'll need um, if you want to uh, participate interactively with the activities today is setting up this OpenAI account um, and specifically having an API key associated um, with that account that we'll use um, to make some calls to their uh, models and their uh, resources that they give. Um, and we'll walk through that as we get to those parts. Again, I'll just put once more with the key links for today as, we, as people are hopping in, we'll give um, probably another three to four minutes um, for people to jump in before we get started. Um, so again, if you haven't already, please take a second to um, uh, uh, create an open AI account if you want to follow along with the activities later today um, and generate an API key that we can use.
Good morning, Ben. I made it into the room. Morning, Rebecca. Nice to see you. And again, I'll just drop the kind of key links for a day one more time. Um, looks like still having a few people hopping in. So yeah, maybe we'll give it one more minute um, and then we'll kick off for our day three activities. Alrighty, why don't we go ahead and get going. Um, so welcome back everyone. This is our day three of our machine learning for materials bootcamp. Um, so again, I'll, I'll keep spamming the chat just as uh, in case anyone is uh, uh, missing uh, links for the materials here and I'll, um, as we get going. Um, but for today, so I jump down. Um, just as a, a reminder, like we've done for the past few days, you know, the, the goals and the things we're trying to introduce here is we're trying to um, kind of expose everyone to some high level kind of concepts and ma uh, material science, machine learning research. Um, we're trying to introduce some of these um, useful Python packages and other resources that might be you know, useful to learn about later on, um, hopefully kind of spark interest and show how uh, machine learning can connect to some various areas of research. Um, and specifically uh, material science where we can. Um, and then hopefully we'll you know, make some connections and, and definitely you know, if anyone has questions after the bootcamp, I'm always uh, you know, available to, to answer questions as well. I'm happy to, to chat with people. Um, thanks to those of you that um, stopped by the, um, the discussion sessions outside of these. It was a uh, useful you know, talk through, um, answer questions, um, talk about some specific, you know, applications and things people are trying to do and hopefully, you know, steer you in the right direction. Um, for day three, our goal and our theme is um, large language models, natural language processing. Um, and then also I didn't put it as a bullet point on here, but kind of data extraction is a, a theme for the activities that we'll be working through today. Um, so one of the key things that we'll be seeing and getting experience doing is, you know, uh, reading through um, papers using machine learning models, uh, pulling out useful data, um, and we'll show an example of you know building a data set by purely just uh, having models scan through papers for us and hopefully streamlining the process of um, assembling databases and um, reading through papers in an efficient way. Um, and again, my last you know general reminder before we hop in is, you know, my main motivation, my goal um, for or one of my big goals for these boot camps is really to answer your questions, um, to talk through any confusions and misconceptions, um, because that's really, again, what makes these, I think, useful, um, as opposed to just, you know, watching a, a lecture online where you're not able to interact and, and answer and ask questions as you go. Um, so we've had some you know, really nice questions and discussion the past couple of days. So please, you know, don't hesitate to, you know, stop me at any points and um, ask anything as it is coming up. Um, and then I have one last slide, I'll show that maybe at the end um, as well. Um, but something that uh, is also a bit different today is um, instead of, you know, lecturing for, uh, you know, 30, 45 minutes at the start, um, we'll dive kind of straight into our uh, activities for the day. Um, and we'll kind of layer in some of the um, lecture type information as we're walking through um, this interactive activity. Um, so right here at the start, I'll, I'll pop out of the slides and, and go back to our, um, again, shared uh, bootcamp directory folder. Um, so again, I'll put this link one more time in the chat if you're um, following along. Again, I'm hoping that um, everyone will be able to, to follow along with the activities today. Um, so in the day three folder, um, we have our you know, quick intro slides I went through, um, but everything else is in this um, Jupyter notebook file, which we can again open up by just right clicking. And if again, if you've been for, here for the past couple of days, you can open this up in Google Collaboratory. Um, again, if that's not popping up for you, you can go to connect more apps um, and you should be able to add the Collaboratory app. 
Um, so if I search at the top here uh, for collaboratory, that should pop up. Um, and that will let me load up this file um, by just double clicking or right clicking to get into it um, here. So you should see something like this. I'm gonna go to this other tab, um, which is when I was uh, using the second go just to make sure things were working. Um, but hopefully this uh, is what everyone um, will be looking at, looking at alongside with me here. Um, so I'll zoom in a bit so you can see what I'm looking at. Um, before we jump in, um, again, just to go through everything for the, the kind of setup, um, we won't use this for a little bit, um, but I did mention it's, um, we will need later on an OpenAI um, API key. Um, so this API key will let us you know, make calls to um, their resources. Um, if you've created an account recently, you should have some um, free credits essentially that they will give you at the when you create an account. Um, if you've had an account for a while, I think those expire after a bit. Um, so if you don't have any credits available to you, unfortunately, um, you do have to then give them uh, some sort of payment information. Um, if anyone is in a situation where you, you know, really are trying to uh, work with this uh, during the boot camp, but you don't have any credits available to you, um, I think I might have one extra account that has a few credits still left on it. Um, so if you send me a, a direct message in chat, I can try to um, give you that. Um, after the bootcamp, I'm going to go delete all of the API keys or anything that I share out. So um, it won't be, it won't work for you later, but during you know this session here, at least you can see what it looks like a little bit. Um, so you should see these here. If um, you haven't created any yet, um, you just can uh, create a new one here. You can give it whatever name um, you want. Um, and um, make sure you copy that and save that somewhere else locally because we will then need to uh, use that later on. So um, if you have that all good to go, um, then we can hop back over um, to the bootcamp uh, notebook itself. Um, and like I said, the, the theme for today is kind of working with text data. Um, something, uh, again, just to, to call back to some of the previous days that is kind of a theme across the days as we are uh, rapidly looking at more and more complex models. Um, so yesterday we introduced the idea of neural networks and, and deep learning. Um, this is uh, very much in the same vein. Um, everything, all the models that we are working with today, everything that we do will be under this you know, umbrella of deep learning. Um, and because these models are getting more and more complex, I'm you know, sort of taking the approach for these activities that we are going to um, not really dig into like the details of a lot of these models. Um, if you're interested, um, I can try to give you know, some additional information. But the big picture idea is that you know, we are running these deep learning models. Um, a lot of these have been pre-trained for us. I think actually all of these will have been pre-trained for us. So this is much more skewing towards the, the idea that we are using models that someone else has trained, um, as opposed to we are you know, training our own models to do something for us. Um, so it's a slightly different approach. Um, and so because of that, again, we're, we're kind of um, shifting away from looking at all like the details of like, how would you train these models and how would you um, go in and set things up uh, in detail? Um, because a lot of that is also, you know, way over my head as far as knowledge. Um, we're much more uh, focused on, you know, how can we make use of these tools? How can we do interesting things um, and use them um, for our benefits? Um, so I'll start working through um, some of the initial code here. We do have some initial just setup stuff at the beginning. Um, as a reminder, you can click the, the play button on the left here. Um, you can also just select a cell um, and hit shift and enter um, or shift and return. Um, and that will also kind of run through. So if you ever see me running something where I'm not clicking through, that's probably uh, what I'm doing as well is just hitting shift and enter. Um, and that will run and go to the next cell. Um, so we'll do a little bit of, of uh, installation of things here. Um, as this is um, installing, I'll, I'll call attention to some of the you know terminology here. I mentioned you know we're under this big umbrella of deep learning models, um, and specifically the type of models initially that we'll be looking at here are these um, transformer models. Um, so transformers again are just referring to a specific structure of neural networks. We talked a lot yesterday about you know varying the the types of neurons and the structure of the neurons and the connections. So transformers are just you know one way to set that up. Um, and uh, another theme that we've been, uh, you know, introducing, and we'll show this off in these next couple of slides here, 
or these next couple uh, lines here is this idea of tokenization when we're working with uh, text data. So we've talked about, you know, featureization um, in the context of, you know, material science data. We talked about adding in elemental properties to represent our materials. Um, when we work with text data, the way uh, that we represent our data to the machine learning models is by something called tokenization. Um, so the idea is that we take whatever the inputs, whatever we're wanting to you know, feed into the model, um, whether it be you know, just this text string at the top here, and we tokenize this into individual uh, bits of information that we can feed into the model. And these get fed in just as a big long vector, just like we um, saw yesterday with the neural networks. Um, and the way that we take you know, these words and feed them into these words or these concepts or, or whatever these um, things are, um, you can see in this case, there's a um, kind of special character here. There's the, the pound signs in our string here. So we started with this word, you know, boot camp together. Um, and the tokenizer, you know, split this up into two different things. So it's like, you know, this is now these two separate tokens that are, you know, added together. And this is what these special characters are telling them. Um, so, uh, but on the, on the back end, what gets fed into the model is similarly just a string of numbers. So all the tokens have a number associated with them. Um, these are predefined in whatever uh, tokenizing process we used. Um, so I skipped over, I think, some of the details here, but we you know, loaded in um, this BERT tokenizer specifically. So we imported uh, from this transformer package. We loaded in you know, this one specific type of tokenizer called this, called this BERT tokenizer. Um, again, we're going to gloss over the details of exactly what BERT is, um, but uh, focusing on the, the, the high-level ideas that are going on here. Um, so we use this tokenizer that someone else has defined. All the words, all the characters here have a number associated with them. Um, and so we just can take our string, we can break it up into individual tokens, and then we can turn those tokens into numbers. And so at this point, we are feeding in, just like we've seen previously, you know, we're feeding numbers into our deep learning neural networks. Um, and you can think of everything at this point as, as very analogous to what we've done previously. Um, it's just that the, the models um, were trained on this type of data um, that was built from these strings. Um, yeah, so so are there rules, so great question in chat, are there rules that the tokenizer uses to distinguish a word into two separate words like the bootcamp case? Um, so yeah, this is the you know one that I'm particularly familiar with because um, I've seen this happen. Um, so yeah, this this kind of double pound sign here is a, a way to show, you know, this is concatenated or added together with the previous um, token in the stream there. Um, there are plenty of other like special cases. So uh, you can think of the, the tokenization process as basically a dictionary of all the words that it knows exist. Um, and they're just getting you know, assigned basically a random number. Um, and then when there's any special cases, if we feed something in that the, um, the tokenizer doesn't recognize. So if I you know, add something on here at the end um, that is just you know, gibberish, then we can see potentially how the tokenizer is going to handle that. Um, so in this case, um, so you know, it reads in the comma. It you know pulls off. It thinks as it's like okay, there's a word, um, and then it's saying okay, here's a bunch of custom things. So it's adding on these like custom additions. So it doesn't quite know how to handle them. So it looks like in this case, the bird tokenizer is using this like uh, double pound sign to mean like a custom new thing that it hasn't seen before. Um, but uh, different types of tokenizers might have other. Um, um, other strategies and other ways to handle like custom things that aren't in their like baseline dictionary um, that you originally start with. So yeah, it's a great question. Um, so yeah, another another quick question here. It seems like the number of tokens and token IDs is different. Um, that's a great question. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, that's a great question. Why are the tokens and the token IDs different? Um, I think there are two extras. And I suspect, I don't know exactly that this is this specific case, but there are specific tokens for like the start and the end of a string. So I suspect they've added on a token that is like, this is the start of the sentence and then a special token that means this is the end of the sentence. Um, so it helps define like um, the positions of things in the string that we've given it. 
Um, so I think that could be a reason why. Um, and I think that uh, is what, yeah, as we pointed out in chat as well, the, I'm forgetting what CLs and SCP stand for, but yes, I think that's meaning like the start and end and um, uh, essentially encoding some sort of structure of the string into the tokens as well. Uh, and I believe that's probably why they're like 101, 102, because these are like standard ones that are defined as opposed to these other numbers. Um, so yeah, that is a great question. Um, oh, and yeah, yes, it is <laughs> included here as well. You'll see it, uh, we print out, I forgot we printed it out below also. So yes, that's showing the, the start and the ending. Um, and yeah, another great question, are there any general rules to like generate the token ID? Um, so I'd say, yes, there are rules. They would be encoded in, you know, whatever this tokenization process is. Um, so whoever, you know, defines the, the tokenizer would, you know, come up with those rules. Um, it might have a strategy for assigning the numbers, but I don't think it is, um, from our perspective, as like a user of these, um, it is not um, uh, especially like needed to like understand all the exact details there. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is um, this isn't true of, of um, all the tokenizers, but there are some tokenizers that would be you know, specific to a certain language. So there might be, um, this one might be a specific you know, English tokenizer. There would be other ones that would say, here's how you understand other languages, other words that are out there. Um, another thing that is common if we think of more like scientific applications is there are ones that are specific to um, other types of strings. So if you're familiar with like organic chemistry, there's this concept of smile strings that represent organic molecules. It's like big long string of characters that show all the, the connections and structures of your molecule. Um, so there are tokenizers that are designed specifically to interpret smile strings and identify those. Um, so there, this is where we can kind of define what is the language that we want the model to operate in um, can be incorporated into the tokenizer here. Um, so we'll jump down. Um, so that's our, our kind of introduction to like, what does this data look like? But um, after this point, again, the, the takeaway and the thing to, to remember is we started with words, we're breaking them up into chunks, we're assigning them numbers. And then at that point, we're feeding numbers into our neural networks. Um, so it's very, very similar at that point to um, working with any other uh, neural network or machine learning application that we've seen before. Um, and yeah, another couple of good questions as kind of follow-ups here, you know, are these predefined um, for the pre-trained model um, and then they can't change um, for like separate trials? So I think, yes, they would be like uh, kind of predefined. Um, so the tokenizer itself, um, I think by default is usually um, kind of fixed. Um, and like I said, there's, you know, some hopefully um, customization added to it so it can handle things that it hasn't seen before. It's not just going to crash if you give it um, a, a word that it hasn't seen before, or like uh, if there's a typo in a word, for example, it won't just like crash because uh, it doesn't recognize that. It will have strategies to uh, interpret those. Um, and some specifically will have strategies for you know, handy, handling common typos, like it will uh, potentially uh, help try to like correct um, to a word, to a nearby word that it has seen before. Um, and can they be extended by the user? Yes. Yeah, so, so we could um, load in this tokenizer here, and then we could, you know, customize it. We could do like additional um, training to it, essentially, or change it somehow. So we we aren't only limited to using like a pre-trained tokenizer. Um, in this case, we're just for simplicity, you know, using a pre-trained um, BERT uh, tokenizer. In this case, um, but there's there's all sorts of flexibility in, in training those as well. So that's kind of a a separate task. And we would think of that if we're mapping onto the ways we've kind of talked um, about machine learning yesterday, we would map this onto like a featureization task. It's talking about how do we represent our data before we actually feed it into um, the deep learning models. Um, so this, this would all be a sort of yeah, featureization, feature engineering, um, all kind of goes into this category when we're talking about uh, language models. So yeah, those are all some great questions. Um, so with that kind of initial uh, thing set up, we'll hopefully start jumping into um, actually working and um, looking at some language models and seeing, you know, what do these do? How can we use them? 
Yeah, so another great question. Maybe I'll, I'll <laughs> jump into this before I go in here. Um, so yeah, what do I mean when I'm saying, you know, train the tokenizer um, or using a pre-trained tokenizer? It's, it seems like this is, yeah, just a case of assigning numbers to character sequences. Um, yeah, I, what I mean, I think, is establishing what that baseline dictionary is. Um, so if we had a data set, um, we can train the tokenizer, basically meaning just like process the uh, some candidate in, input data through the tokenizer and see, uh, come up with what those labels should be. So it will like look at all the text and it'll say, here's the labels I've come up with. Um, it will make these, um, I guess, number assignments. Um, but it is, I guess, yeah, not the same thing as like training a neural network or training a machine learning model. Um, it, is, it is separate from that. Um, so basically it's, it's, you know, generating this dictionary is, is another maybe phraseology that you could use there. Um, but yeah, different than, than training, I think, a machine learning model. Um, so we will jump in and yeah, the first thing we'll do is look at, um, or again, making kind of a distinction between kind of traditional language models. And then later on, we'll look at some large language models, which is, um, uh, a kind of slight differentiation here. Um, and the, the kind of resource that we'll point out here if we're thinking about you know, things that you might do later if you're trying to play around with these kind of things um, is I definitely want to plug um, Hugging Face. Um, so Hugging Face is very analogous to like Scikit-Learn, for example, where Scikit-Learn gives us a lot of um, uh, examples of um, kind of traditional machine learning models. Hugging Face um, has a lot of uploads of uh, different types of language models. So we mentioned, you know, there are some models that are specific to different languages um, or different kinds of um, tasks that people have done. So for example, there's a tag here um, for languages at the top. If we are looking for um, a specific language, um, we might uh, go look here. And then instead of, you know, loading in the models that we'll look at um, in the example here, we could just substitute in for uh, other models that people have trained and uploaded and made available to us. Um, so that's just something to, to kind of point out there. Um, they also have a, a lot of you know, resources for data sets, um, for other libraries, for things that people are using. Um, if you're trying to just get a sense of like you know, what is out there, um, Hugging Face is one of these really kind of nice uh, places to just kind of peruse through, um, see what is available. Um, but now we'll jump into the next uh, chunk of code here. <clears throat> Um, and first, I think we just, yeah, kind of define some simple um, functions that we'll use in a second. Um, so what we're going to do is first uh, basically just use a language model and see if we can map onto a classification task. Um, so can we take some sentences and can we classify them by um, what is the content of these sentences? So here's um, our uh, data that we'll look at here. So we have three sentences, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, and the American Civil War ended in 1865. And so what we can do is we can just use this uh, quick you know, classification function that we defined um, just to, to walk through kind of at a high level you know, what this is doing. This is just reading in the text that we give it, so the string. Um, it is reading in you know, the label that we are going to uh, assign to it, um, and then it you know, outputs um, scores and labels from this classifier. So this classifier here, um, this like pipeline is basically, this is like loading in the model. So we can see, you know, here's this model that, um, again, we just pulled off of Hugging Face. Um, this string is associated, we could you know, find this one you know, under here somewhere if we were looking for it, um, if we searched for it. Um, and this basically queries the, the existing model that is hosted there for us. Um, and this zero shot classification is referring to that we're just going to ask it, you know, predict uh, the classes that we give it. So uh, with that defined and with our three sentences, we can go through. Um, and the first time we run this, it'll do some like downloading and setting up of the model. Um, this will all kind of happen on the back end, but then it should make um, classifications of each of our three texts. Um, and we're going to ask it to classify into three categories, science, literature, and history. And so what we would expect, um, um, I think intuitively, you know, looking at the sentences that we've given it, is that we would expect, you know, the first sentence would kind of fall under science, 
Um, the second one would fall under literature and then the third one would fall under history. And so what we get as an output here, because we've given three classes, is essentially a probability estimate um, from the model um, that each of these you know, falls under each of the classes. So we have you know, about 94% um, that this is falling, that the, this is scientific. Um, interestingly, it thinks that Romeo and Juliet is also very scientific. Uh, or no, sorry, it's reordering them here. You guys should be careful. So it is saying it's ordering these by the highest to lowest rankings. I was forgetting. So it's you know 94% science here. It is 99% literature, and then it is 96% history. So you know ballpark. It seems to be doing you know fairly well at identifying those three uh, three things. Um, again, the the you know quick and dirty classification function that we set up, we can define the classes that are available to it. Um, so we can also ask it, you know, only give us a prediction um, on the science class. So we can give it all three sentences again, and we can tell it, um, you know, predict what is the probability that each of these three is just in science. Um, and what we're doing here is we're essentially um, seeing, you know, how the model is behaving under these different situations. So when it has three options to pick from, it might perform differently than when it only has kind of one option to pick from, and it's telling us yes or no. Um, so it looks like in this case, you know, it's 90, almost 97% science for the first, and then basically zero, and then, uh, you know, 22% uh, or close to 23% science for the third one uh, for our American Civil War sentence. So <clears throat> if we just use, um, for example, like a 50% probability as being you know, true or false, we can then assign you know, binary labels to these predictions. Um, so this is just layering uh, this additional kind of task on top of the uh, classification that we did previously. Um, so if we do this, then we can get our outputs to tell us you know, true, false, is this science or is this not science? So as we might hope, we get you know, true, false, false um, for our three sentences. And so you know, this is the first thing, um, just to you know, think big picture about where we're hoping to lead towards, is what we're thinking about is you know, how can we extract data from papers? Um, so we, we've shown is that you know, purely with a language model, we can um, get a classification um, out of that model. We can have it tell us um, you know, this is relevant to whatever the, the parameters are that we set. So this is relevant to science. You know, these sentences aren't. So if we are then looking through a thousand sentences, hopefully we can have a model that will tell us, here's all the relevant things that are most uh, interesting to you. Um, so this is where uh, we'll jump into um, thinking about you know, some, some bigger frameworks. So this is some work that uh, one of the, the postdocs in our group, um, Dr. Polak was working through. Um, and this was uh, in collaboration with some undergraduate students who are helping uh, kind of set up some of the, the tools. And I think they are in the process. So I think this maybe already is published. Um, we have at least the, the preprint on, on archive for how they took, you know, kind of the methods we were showing above um, and actually tried to do um, some real, you know, large scale processing of data. Um, so the idea again is that we are going to um, pull in just some like full research papers we're going to break those up into sentences, um, process, uh, do some you know, simple text processing just to set those up and configure those. Um, then do just like we showed above this zero shot, you know, binary classification. Does this contain relevant data to us? Um, then you know potentially do some additional you know fine tuning or human assisted um, steps to uh, make sure that things are, are going on correctly. Um, and then finally, we can uh, you know, structure that into a data set. And where we're hoping to lead towards is that you know, then we can get out a useful data set that we can use for maybe future uh, machine learning efforts. Um, so we can get a data set of materials, properties, um, values, units, anything else that might be you know, useful to us. Um, and I believe this was done, and we'll show this in a bit, um, using some of the more advanced large language models. Um, but I think we'll show it initially um, just as we showed you know, previously, using some of the, the freely accessible and much faster um, hugging face models. Uh, so I think these are some of the, the key results that they reported uh, in their paper there. If anyone's interested, maybe I'll, I'll circle back uh, to look through at these in detail. But they were looking at you know, some different model types. Um, and the idea is they're pulling out this precision recall curve um, to show how well they're classifying across the different models. 
Um, so I think the best models they were seeing was this uh, chat GPT-4, um, which we'll see here in a little bit. Um, so that's the, the first uh, quick question there. And I think, um, yeah, I'll check through chat. Looks like maybe I missed a question. Um, Yeah, so so it's a, an important an important nuance here. Um, the, so the question basically is, yeah, where is the training of this model? Like we never trained the model. So so yeah, the model was pre-trained. This is just a language model. Um, and so what we did is we asked it. Um, so this is a, a pre-trained um, language model, and it is already set up to classify uh, text that is given to it. Um, it does not, um, um, sorry, it, it does not have embedded like classes in it. So we can tell it, um, you know, by giving separate text inputs, we can give it labels to, um, understand. And basically what it's telling us, what, what it's kind of doing on the back end is we're giving it, you know, here are these three labels and we're asking, you know, how similar is this text that we're giving as input? to these other labels that we're giving it. And that's how it's trying to do this classification. Um, but it's taking this um, you know, underlying language model and kind of mapping it onto a classifier. Um, so that's what this uh, you know, quick chunk of code is doing here. Um, so the idea is that you know, when we give it, um, maybe I didn't point out um, strong enough, you know, we can give it multiple classes and say like, you have these three options, you know, tell us how well the text maps onto these three things. Um, or, which the second part we did, we only give it the science option and say, just is this science or is this not science? Um, but the idea is, yeah, we are not uh, training the model at all. This is already a pre-trained you know, language model. Um, and yeah, thanks. <laughs> Someone already yeah, grabbed the specific model. So if you want to go, um, if you're interested to read through some of the details of that model specifically, yeah, the, the link is in chat there. So thank you guys for, for hunting that down. Um, and yeah, I can definitely, um, in, the, in the spirit of trying to uh, you know, give some of the basic information here, I realize I went very quickly through this. Um, so so um, this is one of the kind of canonical plots that we would make for a binary classification task. Um, so precision and recall are two of these metrics. Um, we mentioned or we, we showed yesterday this um, uh, confusion matrix. This, in that case, it was like a three by three matrix where we were showing, you know, predictions on one axis uh, and then the true labels on the other axis. So this is just another way to visualize that same data. Um, so if I'm remembering right, precision, um, or sorry, recall is maybe the, the easier one to uh, start with. Um, so recall is asking um, of the true cases that were in the training data set, how many were correctly identified and predicted as true um, by the model. So it's a, a ratio of number of true predictions to how many true predictions were in the, uh, the data set. So um, what we see is that as we kind of move along these lines, there's a trade-off um, between these two things. So these all are representing um, different kind of versions of the model. Um, precision, on the other hand, is I'm forgetting the specific definition. Precision is the kind of opposite. It is looking at how many, let's see, I'm going to get the definition wrong if I try to pull out <laughs> directly from my memory. So let me just go um, jog my memory really quick uh, so I don't say it incorrectly and cause any confusion. Um, Yeah, this. Okay. Yeah, so it's looking at, um, yeah, the number of, uh, you know, true positives that we're predicting divided by the total number um, in the, uh, the class there. And so then the recall is like the percentage that you are correctly, uh, the model is correctly remembering is maybe one way to, another way to say that. Um, but yeah, the, the Wikipedia page there is always useful to, uh, to call back to um, because it is just 
slightly different versions of the, the same thing. Um, but the, the underlying idea here is that we are kind of trading off between two extremes. Um, so you can see that all of these lines kind of meet at the bottom right of the plot, and they also meet, um, interestingly, some of these don't actually match this, but they should all meet at the top left as well. Um, and so in one extreme, you have a precision of 100%, but a recall of 0%. And then at the other extreme, you have a recall of 100%, but a precision of 0%. And so it's like these two um, extreme cases of performance where you have a model that either predicts you know, everything as the true class or predicts everything as the false class. And so those are the two extremes. And so the, the qualitative understanding of these precision recall curves is that we are looking for um, an, a situation kind of in the top right would be like the ideal case. So that'd be having you know 100% precision and 100% recall. Um, but obviously the models almost never you know, reach that. So um, we're looking for a trade-off where we're kind of at the far top right that we can get to. Um, it's like qualitatively how we understand these precision recall curves. Um, but yeah, definitely to, to pull up the, the details of the um, the math, I definitely encourage you to, to peruse through the, the Wikipedia page is always useful to, uh, to jog your memory or just uh, remember all the specific details there. Um, so with that, I will keep kind of jumping down. Let me just make sure I didn't forget anything here. Um, I don't think so. Um, so what we'll do next is we'll show, again, a slightly more real world case um, so we're going to um, use this package called Feed Parser. This lets us download real papers um, from Archive. Um, so this is a, a publicly available paper repository. Um, and we can actually just go grab some real papers and start seeing you know, how does this work when we actually feed in um, real information. Um, so again, we're making a, a quick function here that sets up and lets us search on Archive. Um, I won't go through all, all the details here, but basically it's um, using their API to you know, make some calls to their um, database um, and we'll pull out some papers for us. Um, so the, the thing that we set up and I'll, I'll look through right here um, with the function that we made is we can you know, set some key search terms and basically search through the papers um, to pull out, I think we probably limit it to like five examples or something like that. Um, but uh, we you know, set up our search terms, and then we can print out, you know, here's the abstract, here's the titles of the papers that we found. Um, or no, maybe it doesn't limit it. It's actually pulling quite a bit. So let me scroll back to the top here to show. Um, so yeah, we found 33 papers, actually. Um, and specifically, what we're looking for here is this bulk modulus and uh, crystalline is our keyword. So we're looking for crystals and we're looking for this one uh, materials property called the bulk modulus, um, which gives us some idea about the mechanical properties of the material. Um, so um, with this, we can, uh, the strategy we're gonna use initially is we're gonna you know, look through the abstracts and we're gonna see, you know, is there relevant information in the abstracts that we can um, pull out um, to, uh, to use and to, um, to look at in more detail. Um, so we'll use this as our input data, um, and then we'll do, um, well, I think first it looks like we do a, a, a quick uh, quick and dirty filtering where we just say, you know, only pull out sentences that have a unit in them. So they have gigapascals. Um, and so that'll be a, a quick filtering we can do just to get only things that seem like they're probably reporting, you know, some kind of materials, proper, uh, materials property. Um, so that's what this first, I think, uh, chunk of code does here. And so then we can reprint out uh, kind of a subset of that data. Um, so here's all of the, the abstracts from the papers where they mention um, um, something that is uh, more specifically relevant. So we see gigapascals here um, that is being mentioned. Interestingly, maybe I overly simplified because some of these don't have that in there. Um, oh, it looks like it's still, it's still just printing out the title. Gotcha. So it has the title here and then there are strings for the ones that are reporting um, specific units in them as well. So we can see um, all those sections have been pulled out. And so then we'll use, again, the classifier that we had previously. Um, but in this case, 
Well, what we're going to do is set up is say, you know, is this uh, bulk modulus or is this not bulk modulus? Um, it's kind of the classification we're asking the model to perform. So we'll let this run. This will take a little bit longer because again, we're processing a larger amount of data here. Um, <clears throat> so we'll let that run and then we'll look through the results here in a second. Maybe I'll open this up on the other screen. And yeah, if there's any other questions while we're waiting for that to run through, let me know. So we're just, this should take I think a minute or two is what it normally takes, but we'll see. Okay, looks like mine has finished up. Um, and I'll, I'll point out, uh, I forgot to mention a second ago, but um, again, you're definitely free to try out other things if you're interested. So just by changing these um, your strings at the top here, if you want to look for other things, um, you can absolutely you know, modify this on the fly and kind of see what other data you can pull out. So this is a, a simple modification you can make to the strings included here uh, as we're going through. Um, and you can see, you know, what type of data you're pulling out. Um, the other thing you'd want to change if you're kind of updating on the fly um, is you would then um, want to pull out, let's see, there might be something else you want to change and I'm missing it. I don't know, maybe that should be okay. We'll see. Um, anyway, I'll just go back down to where we were running here. So uh, we're classifying all of the, the um, sentences that we found previously. Um, so now here is what we've pulled out as to be you know, sentences that are classified as being relevant to us um, having good information. So we see, um, uh, as we kind of hope, we see a lot of uh, sentences that have you know, units in them. Hopefully they also have some description of the material too. So in this case, we have a, a composition here. Um, so we have uh, compositions and their uh, materials uh, and their properties. Um, so we've kind of extracted hopefully useful information here. Um, and so yeah, the question is, is it using the same classifier for science, history, et cetera? Um, and, and what does this mean to classify according to the bulk modulus category? Um, so yeah, the classes themselves, if I go back up here. So the, the labels associated in like the definitions of the classes can actually be defined on the fly. Um, so they are not again, hard coded into the classifier in this case. Um, this, this single classifier function that we defined, we'll go back up to it. Basically, in that function, every time um, we are calling here, um, so the single classifier is then calling this underlying classify function um, here. You know, this defines the labels every time we call this function. Um, so we can think of this as every time we call this, whatever we set the labels to be, that's what it's comparing the input text to. It's saying, you know, is this of the same class as whatever we set as the input? or whatever we set as the classes. So then, yeah, when we go back down here, um, we are redefining the class to be bulk modulus. So when we interpret these results, what we're saying is the model thinks this sentence is highly related to bulk modulus. Um, so that's, that's the task that essentially has been assigned to it. Um, and so it's only gonna give us the sentences that are related to bulk modulus. Um, and then, yeah, good question. How do we know which sentences these came from? Um, I think right now we are printing out the title. So this first line in each pair here, or no, that's not true. 
Oh no, maybe these are the titles. Uh, yeah, I think the first line is the titles of the papers. Yeah, so these seem like titles of papers. Studies on weak uh, tenor and ferromagnet. Yeah, so, so the first line is the title and then the second line is the sentence um, for, for this section here. Um, and then yeah, a question about some of the details here. What is this scent num GPA? Um, I have not looked at the exact details of this code in a bit. So let me see what the kind of terminology, um, it looks like this is just, this is just a, a kind of, uh, you know, string in this dictionary um, or in, let's see, the paper and papers. I'm not sure what the exact object structure is for papers here. Papers and papers. It is, oh, so it's it's wherever the output of, of this search ar archive function is. So this is some object from um, from that, uh, that archive um, uh, library that we're using. Um, and so they just, um, and so we're setting this string. This is basically just like keeping track of, um, of all of the, I think, sentences here um, that we're pulling along with us. Yeah, so I think for a given paper, this is keeping track of, yeah, I think uh, Bolint is, is correct there. Yeah, for each given paper, that sounds right. It is keeping track of all the sentences um, that have uh, GPA in them. Uh, yeah, so there's a good, uh, good sort of statement slash question here. Um, you know, how would we do this on materials project, for example, if we were you know pulling data separately? Um, so usually each uh, repository or, or database or thing we're pulling from would have their own specific um, API associated with them. Um, so specifically for materials project, um, I know they have a lot of you know useful uh, tutorials and examples. Um, so if I just, uh, just kind of on the fly search for uh, your materials project tutorials. Um, I know they, yeah, they've done some workshops in the past and there's a lot of material. So that's what I would use to start from. I don't have anything offhand to be like, you know, here's, here's what I've done with this in the past, but um, I know there are a lot of uh, useful resources, you know, from materials projects specifically. Um, and I assume from other, you know, repositories and databases as well for you know, getting started with them. Um, if there's yeah, a specific one that you're interested in and um, if you follow up with me afterwards, I can maybe try to hunt down and, and give some more specific recommendations or places to get started on those. Um, so yeah, great, a great statement or question there. Um, so as a follow up, you can understand you know, intuitively what the science class, the history class corresponds to. Um, but what if we give a random sentence, then how does it decide um, whether it belongs to that or not? Um, especially if it's not seen that before. So, so it hasn't seen right any of these classes before. Um, so it, you know, the language model has learned the human language and how we speak. Um, so if you think about it, if you know, if we were learning an entirely new subject, and I started talking, you know, and I, it, you know, I'm I'm introducing machine learning, right? And you hear me talking a lot about machine learning, and I'm using a lot of these terms. Um, so I'm I'm using this term, you know, deep learning a lot. And so then I asked you as the, as the human learner, do you think this new sentence is relevant to machine learning? Um, and you're reading through that sentence and it has the words you know, deep learning in it or, or something similar to that, right? It doesn't have to be a direct match. Um, you would have some kind of intuition that says like, oh, I think this sounds like machine learning. Um, that's, that's exactly what the model is doing. So it, it, you know, it decides because it has knowledge about the language. I, I'm struggling to find a maybe better way to describe it than that, but you know, it has learned how to make relationships between the language and what types of words and when they're put together, you know, they are similar to each other. Um, and so that is, I think, you know, a very, very cool um, thing to kind of demonstrate. And so, and so that is that is what it's doing, and you're right. It has not seen these classes before, but it has seen the human language. It has seen how we talk, and so it's able to you know make these intuitive connections. Um, something that maybe is worth demonstrating. I think we did this last time we went through. 
Um, but what if we give, if we go back up to this, this section here, so we mentioned, you know, we can define these on the fly. Um, what would happen if um, we give, you know, some just like bogus uh, labels here, right? So it doesn't have the option between science, literature, and history. It has um, uh, just sort of, you know, maybe one label that's just, you know, complete gibberish, not a word. Um, the second one maybe looks like a word, but is just kind of made up. So let's give, you know, just those two. And then we could ask, you know, what, what's the model going to do um, here? How's it going to try to classify this? So we can see, you know, what happens if, if there's hopefully truly kind of nothing to, to learn there. Then um, we can see what, what the model does. So in this case, we can kind of see, you know, given between these two, it is less certain. So this number has decreased, right? It's not 99% literature like it was in the past. So it's, there's not a good match. Um, but, it, you know, it does try to pick something, right? We've given it this task. You know, what is the probability between these two? And so it thinks that's slightly more likely to be um, noise. So what we can see is that if we don't define the labels well, if we give it things that are... Um, very far away and it doesn't have a good choice, you know, hopefully we'd expect something like this where it's, you know, much less certain. So, you know, if we were trying to do this in a very high throughput fashion, we might set, you know, a criteria where we're like, if it's not 95% or 99% confidence, then just, you know, throw out that answer. We don't trust it. Uh, might be one thing we, we could do. Um, but it is certainly sensitive um, to the terminology used. So we could also say this would maybe be a more difficult task and we might even like argue what the best labels here, but what if we do like, this is science, this is, um, I'm trying to think of like alternative words for science. This is, um, hmm. What if I say like, this is a fact and I say, there's a good one, this is physics. Thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> so let's see what the model thinks here, right? So there's you know three different ways to interpret this sentence, um, and we'll see. So in this case, it's it's you know even more indecisive. It's it's splitting its probability between all three of these. Um, and so it thinks uh, forty two percent you know it's physics, thirty percent it's science. And 27%, it's a fact. Um, and so if we were, you know, depending on how we were trying to use this, we um, might, I think, you know, one of the takeaways I would take from, you know, looking at this is, you know, we need to be deliberate about what are the labels that we're giving and maybe how many labels we're giving because we can, you know, dilute um, the results from the model. So um, I think that's why when we go through the example later on, we chose just, you know, let's give it a single label. Let's just ask it. Is it you know this or not? Is it bulk modulus or not? Um, as a, a way to try to find you know useful things to us. Um, so uh, definitely, you can again play with this on the fly and kind of see um, how you can skew the model in different directions. Um, so I'll scroll back down to the section there, but yeah, I think that is definitely like you know useful things to be thinking about. Um, it looks like we're yeah closing in on kind of the first hour here. So let me see if we have a good point. Yeah, it looks like we're basically at the end of section one. Um, so maybe we'll wrap up there and take our first break. Um, there's maybe one last question I'll, I'll go through here and then yeah, we'll, we'll take a break for 10 minutes or so. Um, so yeah, the question about, you know, would a better model have high probabilities for the three options? Um, oh, would it have higher probability? Yeah, I see. Um, so the way that we've set this up um, is by definition in this section, all of these probabilities, I believe, need to add up to one. Um, so these are these are strictly you know, probabilities that add up to one. So by adding more reasonable labels um, and seeing them come out, you know, with similar numbers, this is you know I would interpret this to mean you know all of these threes are you know competing for being the most likely um, label, um, and so. A better model is, is maybe hard to decide what we think a better model would be. Um, 
you could say, you know, a better model might be more decisive and say it's, it's this label and not that label. But I think if we were, you know, as a group here to have a discussion about which label we think is the best of these three for this statement, I bet we could also have a similar disagreement uh, and, and people would argue for different things about saying which one they think is the best one. Um, so I think it's hard to say what would best be in this case. I think we should just interpret it to mean, you know, the model thinks these three are reasonable um, because they're giving similar probabilities. And because, you know, this is limited to one in each case, um, uh, that's why they're they're lower than, you know, the like 99% to the 96% here when they don't have, you know, good labels to compete with for the other two. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's a, a great question and definitely you know, things to be thinking about um, as we're trying to use these models. Um, so I'll scroll down to the, the end of the section again. And yeah, why don't we take um, our first 10 minute break? Um, go, you can go stand up. Um, if you want to play around with this some more and try out some other things, feel free to do that as well. Um, and we'll jump back in in 10 minutes or so with section two. Um, and again, this is the, the section where we'll start using chat GPT. Um, and there's a section down here for importing an API key. Um, so that's where you'll copy that in if you are uh, following along with that. But I'll, I'll grab a quick timer and we'll take 10 minutes and we'll reconvene here in a sec.
All righty. Hopefully we're making our way back from our break <clears throat> and we'll be jumping in for, yeah, part two of our activities today. So um, the first part, again, the goal and what we're trying to introduce is how can we, in some sense, kind of, you know, hack language models to do classification for us. Um, so by default, you know, they, um, are not you know inherently set up to do classification, but we are you know using the things that they have learned. They've learned um, what human language looks like, and we are um, then uh, you know layering on top of them the the idea that we're asking you know is this similar to another thing? We're giving an example of human language and asking it does it match up to this other example, this label that we're assigning it. Um, and now we're going to do the same thing with. Um, more advanced language models. Um, so there's this term you'll see thrown around, large language models, um, basically just meaning uh, many more parameters. Um, we uh, talked through yesterday and there was a big focus on, you know, trainable parameters in our models. Um, I think we got up to, um, you know, 20 million or so, something like that. Um, and I threw out during the, the lecture at the start yesterday that, um, you know, some of these models, and I think I called attention to ChatGPT, you know, they, um, are you know a few orders of magnitude above that still. So they're in the kind of billions of, of parameters um, uh, range. Um, so as these models are getting more and more complex, they're taking longer to train um, and needing much more um, uh, you know, time and effort to get set up. Um, so again, the theme is that we'll be using some of these models that have already been trained. Um, specifically, we'll be using uh, chat GPT uh, which you may be, you know, familiar with, um, and uh, if you're not, uh, we'll get you know hands-on with it. We'll be using it through again the Open AI um, API um, uh, resource that they give us. Um, so we won't be going through their like default website. We'll be basically making calls to the GPT models um, from the command line and from Python code here. Um, there's a slight difference in how these models are set up. Um, this is just due to how they were trained and the uh, projected use case for you know what these companies uh, want people to be doing with them. Um, but again, we'll be trying to, to ask you know can we use these models to do what we want to do with them, which is we want to to classify text, we want to identify useful information for us, we want to pull that out of text uh, to make available. Um, so the way that they're set up. Um, Oh yeah, I'll definitely see as a question, you know, how can we get the API key? So I'll walk through an explicit detail on that. So if you just go to, um, you know, OpenAI's websites, you'll you know, get to, you know, some uh, kind of page like this. Um, you should be able to go to your account page here. So here I'm logged in under just my personal account. Um, and there is this just view API keys uh, tag on the right side. Um, so you might, you will, if you haven't done this before, you won't have anything here. Um, so you'll just do create new secret key. Um, so I can call this, you know, bootcamp two, um, something like that. Um, it will pop up here. You'll need to copy this um, from the screen here um, and save it in a notepad or something separate um, for a moment. Um, this just to, to, you know, give some slight warnings here, you know, the API key, this, if someone has this, if you have this, um, for example, if you copied that off of my screen, you could go pretend to be me um, through OpenAI. So you can always revoke the keys. This will delete them and make them not accessible. Um, so for example, after the bootcamp, I'll go through and delete these other ones as well, just in case, um, but they will not give you access to this again. So like I created this one earlier today, you know, if I didn't save this, it gives me this abbreviated version, but this is not the, the key. Um, it has a bunch of missing things in it. So you need to save this separately. Um, and you need to, this, this is a, a warning. We're doing this in a you know, slightly insecure way right now. So I encourage you to be very uh, uh, careful with your API keys in the future. Um, in the, the notebook here, we are just like hard pasting it in. So again, if you like, you know, memorize this number and went and used it in yours, um, you, know, you could pretend to be me for a little bit uh, until I go and delete this later. Um, thankfully, I you know, put a limit on it, so it's not like you can you know, go do anything too nefarious. But um, if you are writing code and using API keys, there are smarter ways to set these up where you're not just like hard writing them in your code. I mean, I encourage you to, to go you know, Google and learn how to do that. 
Um, but just for simplicity, we're doing that here just so I can show you know, what this should look like. So you should copy your own key in here. Um, no one can see this through the notebooks because you have your own you know, temporary version of it. Um, so you don't have to worry about anyone else kind of uh, grabbing yours right now. But that is what that should look like. So we'll install OpenAI and basically set the API key um, string here. Um, and that will um, now let the code know whenever we make calls to OpenAI, it will use this and it will know that you know, I'm trying to do things. And so it'll associate with my account. Um, the other thing I guess I didn't mention, hopefully if you've created an account um, on this billing page, so I have it set up so I you know, put in my credit card information um, just for the short term, um, you should see um, under one of these tabs here, it looks a little different on this account, but you should see something where it will tell you how much, how many credits you have. Um, so hopefully it'll say you have like five credits or something, which is the default that they give you like free $5 worth of credits. Um, if you don't have that again, unfortunately, you will have to pay to get this part to work. Um, I can give you one very temporarily, but then I'm going to revoke it after the end of the bootcamp. So send me a direct message if that, uh, uh is your situation. Um, if the key is not working. So if the key is not working, you might need to create another one. Um, if it's just telling you that um, you don't have any credits, then that unfortunately means you do have you, if you want to you know, run this, you will have to, to pay them some money. Um, it is fairly cheap overall. I think like when I've played around with this, I've not spent more than like $5 on my end. Um, just when going through uh, like these activities would be like, I don't know, I think less than a dollar or something. Um, but certainly, you know, if you don't want to set that up and you're worried about that, um, then you can just follow along with what I'll be doing going through here. Um, so um, hopefully uh, that is everyone kind of good and ready to go more or less. Um, so we'll jump in. Um, again, we'll have to define, in this case, a little more complex uh, kind of functions. Um, if you're interested in kind of digging into the, the Python code and um, things that are actually going on here, we can circle back to this later and I can kind of go through. It's telling you the name is not defined. Um, I would make sure you've run and like installed things here. I'd also make sure that it's in quotes here in a string. Um, if, uh, and it should have, you know, a similar format. It should be, you know, SK and then a bunch of numbers like this. Um, so it should look similar to this, but your numbers will be different. Um, and yeah, so I think if you're just pasting in, I would pay attention, yeah, it needs to be a string. So it needs to have these quotes on the outside. Um, that's maybe something that's not immediately obvious. Okay, hopefully that's that's solving those issues. Um, um, I won't show all the details, but there is this like billing section. You can you know set up a, a payment plan if you want. So it's like payment methods somewhere on here if you're trying to, to set up so that you have a few credits. Um, and I think by default, they do this like pay as you go. Um, and you can set some limits. So like I said, it will not charge me over $10 um, is like my current limit. And so I have currently you know, zero dollars. Um, so that would be somewhere on this page where you'd set that up. All right, I'll maybe give. And yeah, thanks for, for copying the, uh, the actual uh, link there in chat. So thanks y'all for, for helping out because um, I didn't grab that specifically. <clears throat> Um, but the one thing that I will call attention to, I'm not going to go through all the details here. Um, the idea behind setting up this prompt here, um, I, I think I got distracted when I was talking before, but you know, the way that these models are configured is they take text as input and they do um, you know, next word prediction. Um, so they take what you give it and they say, what's the most probable next word in this sentence? And they keep adding words to the sentence over and over and over until they predict this special character called the end character. So that's like you know, the end of the sentence, the end of the response. Um, so this is this is how things are set up. If you used ChatGPT, for example, through just like their, their you know, online web interface, um, you know, you write your prompt into the model and you know they separate it into these two responses. But really, again, all the model is doing is it's looking at your response and it's saying, what do I think the most probable next word is? Um, and so that's what this function is setting up for us. It's telling us, um, it's telling the model in, you know, much more, uh, um, 
much less you know, user-friendly terms, um, how to set up that same thing. So for example, the roles here, it's telling us, you know, our role is the user and the model should behave like an assistant. Um, so this is all uh, things that like configure how it responds, um, things like that. Um, the other thing I'll call attention to specifically at the top here is the model type. Um, so there are different iterations of these models. Um, all of these, again, are pre-trained models. Um, so we're using this 3.5 turbo um, version of the model, depending on if you um, have paid and set up your account, there are other types of models you can use. Some of them perform better or worse. Um, for example, GPT-4, I think, is out as well. So you could try switching to 4 um, if you've paid as well. Uh, but basically, this is, again, just setting up those prompts. Um, it is mirroring that same functionality that uh, ChatGPT has set up. Um, so to actually use that when we've defined that prompt function, so here's the prompt function. Um, basically what we do is we set up a string of, uh, or a list of strings uh, that we want to use as input and then print out the result. So the prompt will give us um, the prompt that we started with and then R is our result. Um, so if we run this, um, we can uh, you know, use this as the input and then chat GPT will think, you know, what is the most logical uh, uh, response? And so what we asked it is, you know, write an abstract for a seminar. Um, the key points, you know, use the following things as your key points. Machine learning workshop, GPT in general, chat GPT for researchers, um, chat GPT for materials research. And then the main point is referencing, you know, our latest paper chat extract method. And so this is what it wrote. This is what it thinks is the, the most logical response. It's doing this again, word by word, until eventually at the end here, it got to a point where it said, uh, you know, stop responding. This is the end of the response. And if you, you know, read through this, I think you know, it, it performs fairly well. Um, you might say like, hey, this is, this is pretty great. This is a good starting point. Um, you know, we told it to mention you know, a number of times, chat GPT you know, for researchers. So it's mentioning, um, you know, we will use, use conversations with ChatGPT, um, talking about you know, researchers efficiently retrieve valuable information um, from large volumes of unstructured data. So all this seems you know, like it's giving us reasonable responses. Um, and again, this is, this is you know, what it's set up and trained to do. Um, we can also uh, change things on the fly. So if we append the response and say, um, oh, add in this additional information, you know, we can modify things that go. Uh, that are used there. And so we'll update our response and see um, it takes, uh, so we'll see what it changed. So it looks like it is added, right? This seminar you know, is scheduled for July 20th. So it looks like this was the previous uh, times that we had in here. Um, so these are the types of things that you know we can do with these models. And this is what, again, they're designed to do. Um, they're trying to give us you know, human-like text and completes uh, the, the prompts that we're giving it. Um, another thing that you know, might be more um, sort of uh, useful in different types of tasks that might be useful to us. Um, so maybe we wrote a, an abstract for a journal um, that got rejected and there's a, a separate journal that we're then gonna apply uh, a paper to, but you know, they only have a 150 word limit. So we can take you know, a previous abstract um, that we have and we can say, you know, make this research paper uh, no more than 150 words. Um, change only what is absolutely necessary, make as few changes as possible. Um, so here are the two um, abstracts uh, that it started with. Um, and so these, again, are the types of you know, instructions, things we can do. So we would then probably want to you know, read through and make sure this still makes sense. Uh, this still is conveying the, uh, the information we want and hasn't you know, changed around any of the results, obviously. Um, but, you know, this generally performs, you know, quite well when we give it things to, um, to modify or to build off of, um, or information to, to use as a starting point. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting is, you know, we can do things like, you know, explain the logic behind what you removed and what you kept. So we could, you know, ask it to reflect on these two things and explain differences. So it'll say things like, um, you know, it removed redundancies, uh, simplified, it did paraphrasing, um, it focused on key findings um, to, you know, make those changes, which is kind of interesting to, to think through. 
Um, it looks like, uh, one second, there's just one person who's, yeah, so I was in trouble. So I'll give this kind of quick temporary key just to hopefully get things running for a moment. So that should hopefully um, get things working. And again, I'll go delete that after this. Um, so um, we'll jump back down. Where did I leave off? Um, so here, yeah, modifying this abstract. So that's another thing we could maybe try out. Um, another thing that um, is interesting, we could try to um, you know, create uh, some citations. Um, so say we had uh, this information here, we could say, you know, turn this into um, big text formats. Um, you know, give me uh, a slightly different format for my citation here. And so, um, we can, you know, read through and see here the, the title, um, looks like it's, you know, correctly, uh, structuring this here. Um, I think if I remember right, we set up, there is a typo in here, but maybe I'm misremembering. Um, ba -ba -ba. Oh, no, we already had it in here. So yeah, we added this, you know, fix any mistakes that you find. So I think there is, oh yeah, here. So we included, you know, a typo. The journal was MPJ computational materials um, with this, you know, typo here. Um, and it correctly went through and then changed us back to, you know, uh, correctly spelled materials here. Um, so these are the types of things that, you know, seem to work fairly well, um, with, with well, you know, structured information, uh, feeding it things in one format, asking it to give us another. Um, if there's anything else, you know, people kind of is jumping to your mind that you want to try, um, let me know. We can definitely try some things on the fly and see um, what works or what doesn't work. If you have uh, some examples or some ideas that are, are coming to mind. Um, otherwise, the next thing that we're going to shift on to then um, looking at is how do we use this to then go back to our kind of classification ideas. So we'll see if, uh, if there's any ideas or thoughts in chat. <clears throat> All right, so I'm not seeing anything immediately. Um, there are a few, you may have noticed there's some other like variations of this, uh, of some of the prompts in chat. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll show one of those. Um, something that is, you know, worth pointing out is the, you know, the wording that's used here and the, um, you know, the specific prompts that we give as input. So this, you know, make this 150 words. Um, the model can be, you know, very sensitive, uh, sensitive to these prompts. So when we just tell it, you know, make this 150 words, um, it will give us, I think, something different than what we started with. Um, and so um, something that might be interesting is, is you might go back and change the, the wording here um, and see, you know, how necessary was it to add in these additional kind of constraints um, on the uh, model. Um, and I think if I remember right when we were setting this up, you know, we added these on um, because it event the first time, um, I won't go through in detail, but it ends up like modifying quite a bit of things because it doesn't, it doesn't have the same priorities that we do, right? We just said, you know, make this 150 words. We didn't tell it um, what type of uh, text this was, what's important about this text. So those types of things help kind of constrain and, and do things that are useful. Um, so yeah, good question. Uh, I'm curious, why don't we ask ChatGPT to generate the abstract for a paper in the website rather than using it in Google Colab? Are there any advantages um, of using Colab for, oh, do you mean like, why don't we use just the uh, the like web API here or the, the web uh, tool that they have? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. You. You may be aware. Um, right. They have this you know, web tool as well. You can you know, log in. Um, so you'll see. I have a number of you know past conversations and random things I've tried out. Um, but yeah, you can do the same kind of prompting here um, on the web tool, um, and this is entirely free. You can just do this as much as you want. Um, one of the reasons to do it this way is that it gives us access to other model types. Um, so. The ones that they have on the free version there are usually a few generations behind. I forget exactly what's available there, but um, I mentioned we're using this GPT 3.5 turbo uh, version of the model. And then there's newer versions, GPT 4, and then I think maybe even GPT 5 is out now, um, which have you know, hopefully additional uh, you know, training and work better and, and do things 
um, are basically you know, more up to date. Um, so that would be one reason. Um, the other reason is there's just a lot more customizability here. So obviously I, I'm, I'm glossing over all the details of exactly how this is set up, but there's all sorts of different configurations we can, we can set up here. So we can have it do things in a slightly different way. Um, so someone's saying, they, yeah, you subscribed, uh, but you don't see the 4.0 model in the model list. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, exactly on the details of like the requirements for what gives you access to each model. So yeah, I don't have a good answer to that, but I had the same issues when I was playing around initially. And I think 3.5 Turbo was the one that was working for everyone that we were trying with. Um, but yeah, there might be other models that, that work and they might have different requirements for like when you get access to them or something, but I don't have a good answer, unfortunately, for like how exactly to get four working for you right now. Um, we can maybe go try at the end if we have some extra time. Um, so I'll jump back down here. Um, so let's let's try to use ChatGPT to, to go back to this idea of doing classification and, and trying to you know, process text for us. Um, so yeah, there's someone's you know, mentioning in chat, obviously, you know, uh, you know, plagiarism and um, when I think there's there's all sorts of ethical considerations about how we should be using uh, these kinds of tools. Obviously, they can you know generate lots of text very rapidly. Um, I think the recommendations that I've seen and the 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 guidance I would you know, encourage people to think about is I think it is very useful to like help or something that's been very useful for me is to help give like initial drafts of. Um, of things that I'm writing. You know, I you might have this the same situation, but whenever I'm just staring at a blank page, I find it very intimidating and hard to like get started. Um, but one of the things I find is very, very useful is I think this was built off, you know, an example of, of what I did. When I was thinking about how should I advertise, how should I write up a, a summary of this workshop, you know, I just said, here's a few bullet points, give me something to start with. And so then, you know, I have text and now I can start editing instead of you know writing text from scratch which which tends to be a lot less efficient um definitely if we are um you know for this example of the abstract right we would want to be you know very careful about the wording that is chosen when these edits are made right we're not going to to edit our abstract and then just like raw copy paste this and just send this off without you know really digging in detail here um, so again it's useful to help us maybe structure some of these tasks and ideas um, but it's certainly not replacing uh, the things that we are writing entirely. Um, I think it is viewing it as you know, a tool to kind of help efficiency and help um, come up with some of the um, ideas for structuring things is useful. Um, but obviously it is not doing science. It is not generating uh, new ideas or new results. Um, and certainly it is not... Uh, it, it shouldn't be used to, to sort of take something that someone else had written and then like, you know, rewrite it to essentially plagiarize it. Um, so I, yeah, I would certainly be, be careful about those kinds of things. Um, um, and then, yeah, so a question, oh, so someone's clarifying that, yeah, if, if, if you have some additional information about the differences between yeah the API key and tokens and using different models. So yeah, it seems like there's a little bit of nuance there, um, which maybe I haven't dug into. Um, and another yeah, quick question: Can ChatGPT or these kinds of tools add references? Uh, I think no, <laughs> in the sense that you can ask it. Maybe that's something I'll try out really quick. Um, so I think um, I think if if we have a structure like this where we have a reference. And we say like, okay, I want to take this reference and do something with it. It can it can do that. If we just ask it for references on things, it will just like make up references. So there's this concept and, and a term that's worth you know keeping in mind um, called hallucinations with these models, where they are oftentimes very confident when they you know write text, but they don't have a good idea of when they're just completely wrong. So we can ask the model for like certain facts or certain you know, references or say like, hey, can, can we get a reference for this? It will say, here's a reference for this, but it, it is just completely, again, making things up because it doesn't have access to real-time data. It 
knows what a reference looks like in general. And so it's trying to make predictive text about what a reference would be, but it, it doesn't have that information. Um, so yeah, so it'll make just like gibberish uh, sometimes or, or and then it won't like match up with things. Uh, um, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, if you have a bunch of text, if you have papers and then you're trying to ask where did this source come from? I think, yes, you should be able to do that, but I don't know if I'd do that directly as just like a prompt here, um, because what we'd probably do, and we'll show this in a second when we're classifying, you know, we are very particular about which information we're feeding to the model. So I think that would come out in like separate scripts that would be like, you know, we got this prediction from the model, but if we wanted to tie back to where it came from, from a paper or something, that would be like, contained in our script for, for how things were matched up. And I think we'll show that in some of the examples here. Um, so in the interest of time, why don't we dive back and start making some progress through um, the examples here. But again, thanks for everyone's questions. And, and I think that's all useful things to think about. Um, so we're, we're thinking about this idea of, you know, classification and, and keeping in mind, you know, the, the big picture goal is, you know, can we extract useful data um, from papers? Um, so what we're going to, um, to ask is, or we're going to see is, you know, can we get ChatGPT to give us these, you know, zero to one kind of probabilities from our, our input text, kind of like what we were seeing before. Um, so initially what we'll do is we'll set up some of these texts. So here's you know, some sample text from a paper um, that we're just, you know, printing out here. And what we'll see is um, first we'll do uh, again, the, just the quick classification that we did before. So this is that same classifier. Um, and we'll see what that classifier thinks about the text. So is this machine learning is kind of what we're asking. So that's the, the label. Uh, and so it tells us, you know, the first one is in machine learning. Um, if you, you know, give a quick scan through, it seems like that's probably true. This is looking at some transition metals. Uh, they're looking at defects, da, 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 but there's no real mention of yeah, anything machine learning. Um, in this one, I know this one is machine learning. This is pulled from, I think, a paper that I'd written previously. Um, so random forest, we might, you know, that might tag us that, okay, this is a machine learning model. Um, and then the last one is, I think, some electronic, uh, yeah, band structure calculations. Um, so this one also is not machine learning. So it seems like this one's doing a, a decent job, you know, false, true, false. Um, and so let's see if we can do the same thing with uh, ChatGBT. Um, so first we might ask you know, a general question, you know, what is, what is this text about? Um, and as we've been, you know, pointing out, um, and we're specifically asking for just the middle ones, we're asking about this one that we, we know should be machine learning. So it tells us, you know, this is about the use of random forest models. Um, it was trained on a database, um, but this is not what we're looking for. We're looking for this very, you know, concise, um, uh, reports and hopefully something that's, again, that's just classification. So we can ask it, you know, answer with one to three words. Um, in this case, it is shorter, but it's still not one to three words. So it's not quite constraining the responses enough. Um, what if we just ask it like a yes or no question? Is the following text about machine learning? Um, it says yes, but then it expands with a lot of additional um, information. Um, so what if we change the prompt and then say, okay, is this about machine learning? Answer yes or no only. So now it gives us yes. Um, so the reason we go through this, you know, depending on your background, you might think this is a little uh, tedious, but the idea here is that, again, the prompts are very important. Um, how we set up the prompts, how we word them, um, changes how this model responds, you know, quite heavily. Um, so we, we can condition its responses, we can change, you know, um, just by changing the text input to the model. Um, so if we can get it to respond yes or no, then we can just, you know, relabel these to true or false. Um, so that's what this does, you know, if, if it's yes, just relabel that to true. Um, so now we can define a new, you know, classification um, uh, model essentially. So our classifier now basically will take whatever our input is and apply this prompt to it. You know, is this text about machine learning? Um, and then give us the class at the end. So this tells us, you know, false, true, false, um, the same way that our hugging face model did up here. Um, so this gives us again, the same classifier. So now we've taken the, again, this large language model and kind of molded it into a classification model. Um, notably, this doesn't give um, similarly or differently from the hugging face 
models, it's not giving us that underlying like kind of probability. Um, so I don't think we've looked at if there's a way for it to, to do that yet. Um, that might be something you could play around with if you're interested. Um, right now it's just giving us again, these, these false, true, false uh, uh, labels, um, but we'll see what we can do with those. So in terms of you know, using this for data extraction, what we'd want to do is we would want to, um, again, define what is the thing we're trying to extract, and then we'd want to classify are the sentences you know, related to this thing. Um, so we will um, set our, our kind of target on extracting some band gap data um, and see um, how we can do with this specific task. Um, so again, we'll give a, a, a you know, quick example just from some, some very short text. Um, so here's our three examples. We have, you know, the sky is blue, grass is green. The uh, exciton binding energy in gallium arsenide is 0 0.03 electron volts. And then optical experiments revealed a band gap of 1.5 electron volts with an exciton binding energy of 30 milli electron volts. So here's our example data. Um, let's see what the model does. So it thinks everything is false. Um, so in this case, it is failing to, uh, you know, identify, um, we asked it, you know, the question, does the following text contain the value of band gap, band gap? answer yes or no. Um, so for some reason it is failing here. Um, we can try this multiple times. Sometimes it will, um, uh, change its responses. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, so now it says false, false, true. Um, and I can maybe run this a few more times and kind of see how stable this is. You might be seeing something similar. So false, false, true, or maybe I misread it the first time. Okay, now it seems fairly stable. False, false, true. It seems to it seems to like this. Um, but uh, you know, it's worth pointing out that you know some the model does have randomness in its predictions. Um, it is uh, so it won't always give the exact same result. Uh, so yeah, a couple of good questions in chat. Let's see. Um, so yeah, it's saying you know some other models you know are connected to the internet. They do have real time information. Um, how how are they doing that? Um, I don't know how they're doing that. Um, what I suspect um, is that they are doing potentially something similar to this. Um, so if I was to, to, off the top of my head, right, to suggest how to how I might approach this, um, I might do something similar where whatever prompt you know the the user started with, I might just go to Wikipedia and say scan through or search on Wikipedia for some of the terms here. Um, I might like first get some like keywords out of the prompt, and I would search for some Wikipedia pages, maybe limit myself to you know ten or so, and then I would scan through those Wikipedia pages, kind of just like we're doing here, and say. Is there information related to whatever the user is talking about? And yeah, just use that um, as part of the prompt. Um, something that we I kind of glossed over um, at the start here is the the previous prompts. You know, they are stored um, here, so the previous prompts uh, do exist. Um, similar to the kind of conversation implementation, you know, the previous text is still there so that the model knows what has been talked about before. So you could just use that in the prompt, essentially, um, merge that in somehow. Um, yeah, so and another great question, how do you input new data into an already trained model? Um, classical training means we'd have to like start from scratch. Um, how is that handled? Um, I think it is uh, similar to um, this idea of con uh, transfer learning that we uh, introduced yesterday. So the idea is that the the current state of the model is represented by you know this huge uh, matrix of or I guess it wouldn't be exactly a matrix, but this huge you know database of weights. So the weights are all the connections in the model. They're determining how information is flowing through this deep learning model, and so. Um, Basically, you can you know start training from whatever the current values of the weights are, um, and usually what's what's done is some of the weights are frozen and some of the weights are allowed to change, um, and that's what's referred to as fine tuning of the models. Um, so for importing new data or for tuning to a specific task, they would probably do some kind of fine tuning task. 
um, where some of the weights are updated to try to get the model to shift slightly. Um, but there's probably like a number of baseline models that you start pre you start uh, doing that fine tuning from. Um, but yeah, certainly we would we would not ever kind of start from scratch. Um, when or I don't know if this is true, but you know, I think at this point all of these you know deep learning models are basically always building off of the the previous model. They're never going to like throw out all of the training they did previously, which was you know six months or a year of training and start from scratch. They're always going to build off of what they had previously. Um, so yeah, a, a kind of comment, it would be nice to do a statistical analysis of the responses and then evaluate the probability ourselves of, of multiple runs. Yeah, so if the, if the model's giving multiple responses, you absolutely could do some kind of statistical analysis um, for, the, for the responses here. I agree. That would be that would be an interesting thing to explore. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I'll, I'll jump back in here. So um, what we were looking at, right, is you know from these sentences, we're asking the model, you know, do you think there is band gap information? You know, is there a value of band gap? Um, because what we're hopefully going to get towards is we're going to try to extract that value. Um, so we had. Um, so we have a few other variations of things here that we'll kind of print out. Um, so we'll start to ask it. Um, oh, it looks like these are actually slightly different versions. Okay, so this was meant to have, I was wondering why these were different. <laughs> this sentence is meant to have this preposition at the start of it. Um, I'm not sure where that got modified, but the idea is we're gonna, uh, from the, the chunk of text here, right, we identified this sentence, um, might have you know band gap information that we're interested in. So let's see how we can process that and see if we can get the model to pull out um, this value. So you know as we're reading through, we'd say like, okay, here's what we're hoping to get. You know the band gap is 1.5 eV for gallium arsenide. So let's see if we can get the model to, to tell us that. Um, so we ask it, you know, summarize the data. It tells us you know the data states that it has a band gap of 1.5 eV. So it seems like it's it's understanding this. Um, it's also carrying along this, this exciton binding energy, which we don't really care about in this case. Uh, so let's see if we can kind of get this to kind of uh, give a more concise answer. Um, so we say summarize only the band gap data um, and nothing else um, given in the following text. Now we get a, a shorter response and we've removed the exciton energy. Um, and then let's try um, asking a few you know, related questions. You know, what is the material for, the, uh, for which the band gap is given? Um, what is the value of the band gap? And then what is the units of the band gap? So we'll ask these three separate things and see what it gives us. So it looks like it's understanding, you know, gallium arsenide. It gives us the full name here, which is nice. It's kind of cool to see. It tells us, you know, the value is 1.5 and the units is EV electron volts. Um, so again, it seems like it's, it's uh, picking up on things correctly. Um, so we'll do again a slightly different version here. So we're asking it the, the difference here that we're adding in, right? Is we're adding, you know, give the material name only and do not use a full sentence. So again, we're trying to get this as short as possible. Um, give the number only, do not use a full sentence. Give the units only, do not use a full sentence. So now we get gallium arsenide, 1.5 EV. Uh, why do we have five responses here? Prompt, prompt, prompt. I'm not sure. <laughs> Something weird is going on. Uh, but we get gallium arsenide, 1.5 EV, gallium arsenide EV, gallium arsenide again. I'm just going to rerun that. I'm not sure why we're getting five responses. OK. Something weird happened in that previous run. OK, but this is what we were expecting to see. Um, and so now we've got you know three separate chunks of text which are you know very heavily constrained um, that we can hopefully uh, work with. And so now, what if we ask it you know summarize these values uh, in a table consisting of material value and unit? Um, so now we can have it you know construct our data in a table. So we have gallium arsenide one point five eV, um, and then we have these two others um, which are coming from. Uh, the text above. And so here, um, 
it's then making some mistakes. So we're telling it, you know, build this table, um, but it's uh, again, getting confused, you know, with this exciton binding energy, um, where it's including this in the table as well, it looks like. So we have this binding energy 0 0.2. Um, so it's adding this as a new row. Um, so what we can then ask is, you know, can we get the model to look through and correct mistakes that it's made? Um, so we, we introduce this idea of doubt. There's a possibility that you, uh, uh, that this is incorrect. We ask it, you know, is 1.5 the value of the band gap for the first material in the text? Answer yes or no. So it says yes. Um, it, that is, uh, that's correct. And then we ask it again, there's a possibility that it's incorrect. We ask it is 0 0.02, the value of the band gap for the third material. Um, so again, still it's getting, you know, kind of confused here where um, this should not be the, uh, the energy here. Um, because again, it's the slightly different property. Um, and again, if we rerun this, um, we'll see that, you know, sometimes it says yes, sometimes it says no. Um, so it seems like it's a little bit confused here. Um, this tends to work better. I'll give kind of spoilers. We're using a slightly older version of the model. Um, so it tends to be uh, much better at this uh, when we upgrade to GPT-4, which is I think what uh, they did in the paper. Um, but in this case, again, we're limiting ourselves to, to GPT-3.5, which is slightly worse um, to kind of doing this interpretation. Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, can it output other other things? Um, I think within the framework here, it can just do text. So I believe what, um, or actually, I'm not sure on that. So I'll say I'm not sure. I think it just does text, but it might be able to do other things. And I know there are um, like add-ons that, uh, or plugins that um, some people have written that that help kind of merge into other um, other things. So there might be something yet yeah, to get its output as like a um, uh, as another structure. Um, I guess also tied into that is worth pointing out. You know, you can ask it as well. We we kind of skipped over this example, but um, if I go back up. Uh, it does do a fairly good job at understanding uh, code. Um, so yeah, if you ask it to like write some code, it will do that fairly well. So maybe I'll add it up here um, under this like anything else to try. Um, so if we do, I'll maybe do this on the fly really quick. So the prompt is, you know, uh, So if we just include a simple prompt like this, that should, we'll see what it gives us. Um, so here's the, uh, the output it gives us. So yeah, it gives us it in text, but we can see because we're kind of in a notebook here, um, we can you know, directly, oh, in this case, it's right, you call Python. So we can just get rid of that. And say like you know does this uh, work and it looks like yes this is you know giving us some code that will run um, but yeah I think there are plugins if you wanted this to like directly then be Python code or be a data structure in Python or something like that um, there might be some ways to get that to work um, so I'll hop back down here um, so we've gotten this you know uh, kind of table set up. Um, you know this this ability to edit kind of on the plot on the fly and kind of introduce corrections to this is then something that uh, uh, is important to add in because it's it's often that you know some of these initial errors will exist um, and ideally if you do prompt the uh, the model multiple times and asking you know look at this again is there something wrong here um, it can find those kind of errors. Um, like as we show here, you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but hopefully if we can come up with a, a scheme for doing this, you know, many, many times, we can get rid of the errors that are in there. Um, so um, this is again, what, what was kind of set up and tried um, via another uh, recent paper that, that Dr. Polak was working through. 
Um, and so that's, uh, I think, currently, again, being um, published or in the, and again, the process of being published under this uh, kind of term uh, chat extract you. Um, and so the idea is, is exactly kind of what we introduced there, um, where we have uh, the, the model, you know, look through large amounts of text, uh, identify sentences that contain the data that we're interested in. Um, if it does, then, you know, we go through and we try to construct this data table where we have, you know, the material, the value and the units. And then we uh, question the quality of the data, you know, through these prompts again, we ask it, you know, look at this again, see if you can correct the result. Is there something wrong here? Um, and so the workflow is kind of demonstrated in the, in the uh, image here. I maybe won't go through it in, in all the explicit detail, um, but the idea is this, you know, seems to be working fairly well to rapidly scan through papers, um, to pull data out, to give us access to um, new information. And to give a, a few just like you know, ballpark um, ideas for some of the initial successes um, that we've had uh, using this kind of strategy. Um, you know, previously, just to give an example from a project that I worked on previously, um, one of the ones um, where one of the data sets that I was working with uh, you know, during my PhD, you know, I had spent you know, quite a bit of time combing through papers and pulling data together. And using this method, we, I think, increased the value of, or the number of data points in there by like 1.5 or two times um, just by using this method over what I had spent you know, kind of months trying to comb through the literature to find. Um, so it, it seems to do uh, at least as good a job as you know humans going through um, and definitely much more efficiently and with much less kind of time spent and uh, you know, combing through papers to try to get things. Um, so yeah, good question. You know, can this work for a PDF format? I think it, it can work for PDFs if the, the PDFs are, um, uh, I don't know the, the correct terminology for like different structures of PDFs, but if the text, you know, is accessible, then yes, I think that works. So, so right now it's doing the same thing where it's pulling off of um, archive and um, all the papers on archive are in PDFs, I believe. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, so it'll pull text out of that. It, probably, it might not work for, you know, older PDFs where it's just like hard baked in. Um, it's not doing any like actual like text recognition on the document. So you might have to layer some sort of text interpreter on top of that. Um, so here's yeah, some of the, the key results. And again, they were using in the paper here, um, GPT-4 and instead of 3.5, which is what we're using currently. Um, and so um, the, again, the, the things to point out here, the, the kind of tags in this table here, this no follow-up. Um, so this is saying, you know, we did not do this additional prompting um, where we ask the model to like look back at the data that it's extracted and say like, hey, this could be wrong. Try to try to find the errors here and correct it. Um, so when we look at some of the um, error metrics, this again is the precision and recall that we've uh, seen previously. Um, you know, I'll look at just the overall metrics here. So it was you know forty two percent precision, you know twenty six percent, seventy eight percent. Whereas when we start uh, doing the the additional prompting and using the more recent models, it's up to like you know ninety percent uh, accurate or so. Um, so yeah, good question. Are all the papers in archive accessed or only those the authors submit in latex? Um, I don't know the details of that. I think all of them would be accessed. Um, but yeah, I don't have the exact details of that, um, unfortunately, so I apologize. Um, yeah, my understanding was it, it should be able to access all of the papers on archive. Um, and certainly you could you know, access other repositories as well. Um, I think um, I have to go, maybe it's in the details here somewhere. Um, I think for, for the stuff they were doing for this paper specifically, um, they also went through and, and used some other like paid uh, repositories. Like I think they also had access to Elsevier uh, and other um, uh, paper repositories also. But for the, the example we show here, we just limit ourselves to archive um, just because that's free. So with that set up, we can then kind of demo show this kind of in real time. Um, so here's another property that we might be interested in. Again, this is a, uh, a materials property. This is like a, a cooling, um, critical cooling rate for uh, cooling metal alloys. Um, so we can set that as our um, you know, default here or as our property of interest. Um, we can go oh, get an error because I did something incorrectly. Let's see. Um, 
Oh, um, maybe I lied. Uh, maybe we don't have access to this right now. So uh, previously we're pulling from this data file that Mache uh, or Dr. Polak have put together. Um, it looks like maybe the link to this got messed up at some point. Um, so maybe we'll have to skip this. I'll go message him and see if we can get this up and running again. Um, but this was trying to pull this specific example um, that he had uploaded. Um, let me see if I have that on hand really quick, if I could manually do not have that here. Okay, I'll add a note and I'll go upload this later. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, this uh, section was pulling in the data slightly differently and I uh, forgot to go double check that this link was still working. Um, so maybe I'll skip over this example. Um, and we'll see, uh, I'll skip down, all right, let's see. Uh, so that's using the same there. Okay, yeah, so we'll skip over that. And then um, the last thing that we had kind of going through, um, we are at kind of one o'clock here, so we could take another break here, but actually we've been going pretty quickly. Um, so maybe I'll jump through the last section here and then we'll see if there's um, you know, any uh, uh, other things we wanna try out or discussion to have here. Um, so the, the, I think the last exercise we put together here um, was doing this uh, more high throughput classification, but in this case, again, shifting back to using, I think these hugging face models. Um, so because they run a bit more quickly, um, we'll show the example here. Um, the, the one that, again, unfortunately wasn't quite working is a little bit more involved. Um, it's like the real world example, but we end up running into um, a lot of actual like limitations with um, using the free version of, of OpenAI. Um, so unless we're paying for some of their uh, like higher uh, tiers of access, we run into limitations with like how fast we can call um, their API. Um, so this, uh, again, I'll try to get that link set up again so it'll work, but it, this runs uh, very slow um, just because they only let us uh, essentially make, I think like three calls per minute or something like that. Um, so we'll show the same thing, but this is using the hugging face models, which again, are much faster, um, but we can kind of show in real time. So again, we'll look at the critical cooling rate. Um, we'll pull out um, some papers here. I'll scroll back up to see how many we got. So we got 26 papers in this case. Um, looking for things with critical cooling rate in them. Um, we uh, you know, go through and uh, reduce the number of sentences, um, pull out things that have you know, Kelvin in them is, is kind of the, the search we're doing. So this is just some uh, just pure data processing, just uh, looking for specific strings um, that would be interesting just to help process things a little bit faster. And so this then is what we can use as our input here. So we have the papers, um, we'll keep their DOI and reference when we want to go um, hunt them down later. Um, so if someone was asking about, you know, how do you compare back to, um, this would be how we would probably go track them down in detail. Um, so, uh, so there's a question here, although there are sentences without numbers in them, um, do you mean by doing this like filtering where we're like only looking for things with Kelvin specifically? Um, I think the assumption here is that uh, when we set up this example is that if it's having you know, Kelvin in it, it should have the number next to that. Um, but because we don't know what that number is going to be, we can't you know, search directly for it. So if we search for Kelvin, that should in the same sentence, hopefully have the number um, that we're looking for. So that's the, the goal there. Um, so we can see that you know, that is the case you know, for, some, for some things where you have you know, um, 100 Kelvin per second. Here's another one with Kelvin um, as we're going through. So let's go down to the next section here. Um, so then the all right, the goal is that we're going to classify this by saying, um, is this about critical cooling rate or not? So we did the search on archive. Um, we kind of subselected down for some sentences, and then we'll ask to screen for you know only things that are um, about critical cooling rate, and we'll let that scan through. And so yeah, there's another question here that while well, this is running, I'll circle back to. Um, so yeah, chat GPT or the GPT models are, are trained uh, to treat inputs and responses you know, in a very human-like way. Is it possible that a different model um, that's more you know, code or instruction-like uh, would be better for some of these applications? Yeah, because we're kind of, we're taking this chat model and we're saying, like, okay, let's try to get rid of all the chat and have it just do numbers for us. 
Um, yes, I think if that model existed, then that would be um, probably better uh, for our applications. Um, the, the, I think, real world constraint here is that those other models don't exist. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this is, these are, you know, these incredibly, you know, large companies um, that are paying and taking all the time to like train these models. Um, so this is not something that would be accessible, um, at least, you know, for, for if I'm thinking, you know, just me personally, right? If, if I wanted to go train a large language model um, or a similar model, but have it yet be more tightly tuned to what I'm trying to do, that would be, you know, years of time and, and uh, a large amount of money to, to go do that. So, you know, it might be something that we'd have to go like write a specific grant for if we wanted to go do that. Um, and so that's why we've taken the approach of let's use these models that other people, you know, spent the time and effort to train and see what kind of useful things we can do with them. Um, because it would be at an, an entirely different scale of effort to train your own model and, um, uh, for, you know, your one specific task. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely worth thinking about. <clears throat> um, okay. So this is done. So we've gone through, um, again, I've gone through this example of the critical cooling rates. So here then is the you know, the version of doing this with just hugging face where we're not going all the way to like constructing that table, but we're at least taking, you know, 26 papers. Again, we started a minute, a minute or two ago, right? With 26 papers that we pulled off archive. Um, we did some very quick uh, cleaning of them where we just looked for things with Kelvin. We looked for, um, I think that's all we did, right? Yeah, we just looped to the sentences, uh, searched for uh, things with Kelvin. Uh, and then one other search, there's a search for D plus. I'm not quite sure of the, the syntax here. Um, I'm forgetting the exact details. But anyway, we did a quick search through. Um, and then we used this hugging face classification uh, model that we had set up previously to say, you know, where's the relevance to critical cooling rate? Here's all the relevance to critical cooling rate. So again, we have the title at the top. Um, and so this would be another way that we could, you know, hopefully accelerate the, the kinds of searches we're doing where this could. Uh, we could look through at a glance and say, like, okay, is this a relevant data point that we should add to our database? Um, so we could then, you know, spend a little bit of time instead of reading through a paper or, you know, the entire uh, uh, details, we could, you know, pull out or decide, you know, which of these is worth reading through in more detail. Um, might be the other way to think about this. Um, but this gives us, you know, one, two, three, four um, new data points to consider that we might add to our database. Um, so with that, I think that is, yeah, all of the examples that we had set up. Um, again, the, the, the framework and the um, ideas we're really trying to convey for this you know, theme of day three, you know, natural language models working with text data is, is really thinking about how do we use, um, or what are some ideas for using you know, these models that, that people are publishing that are they're, um, open and available to us to improve the way that we are you know, performing research, um, rather than thinking about, how directly do we build uh, models? It's how can we use the tools that are out there to um, improve our lives and improve the things that we're doing. Um, so yeah, if there's any last questions, um, obviously we're you know, more or less kind of an hour early or so, but um, I think um, rather than just rambling on uh, for another hour to fill time, um, I'll wrap things up there. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll maybe close on really quick um, is again, just to, to plug one thing that I had mentioned once or twice, and that is, um, again, the, the kind of, one of the underlying goals for these kinds of things is, is thinking about undergraduate research. Um, so myself and Professor Morgan, you know, we lead a number of undergraduate research projects. Um, we have a number of projects that are starting this fall and they're not only for students, you know, here at UW-Madison with us, but we are also trying to open up and bring in students from, you know, around the country or around the world that are interested in, in learning about machine learning. Um, so I encourage you to, um, I know we're, you know, kind of grad student postdoc heavy, but if you have your know, undergraduate friends or you are interested, um, if, uh, any undergrads are here as well, um, I welcome you to apply or to share around these opportunities to anyone else. Um, I'll share around this flyer also in a quick follow-up email. Um, and then, uh, just like I, I did before, I'll also grab really quick. I think I had it somewhere here before. 
Um, where did this go? Here we go. Um, so again, there's a quick, just like feedback form um, as we're trying to, you know, improve these materials, make these useful to people. If you have a moment to, to follow through there, um, I'll grab a quick link. Um, maybe I'll just grab the, um, we'd also put the, that flyer out on LinkedIn. So I'll grab a quick link on LinkedIn just to uh, throw that in chat as well. And again, I'll also send out the, uh, um, uh, via email um, with that information following up on the, uh, the uh, boot camp here. So let me grab this. Um, so, um, but yeah, with that, that I think is, is kind of everything I had set up. Um, again, because we're a bit early, I'm, I'm happy to hang out and answer questions. Um, talk through with everyone, but otherwise, that is, I think, the end of our, our formal activities, um, everything we have going on. Um, so I'll close out the recording there. Um, but again, I'll, I'll hang out for a few minutes just in case um, anyone wants to chat about anything.